Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program, uh, the John Huff Podcast 2021 Song of the Year competition. I know you've been waiting all year for this, kids. The time has finally come. And I'll tell you all about it on the other side. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. You know, when I was putting together my editorial calendar in my head, I thought I'll probably do episodes right up until Christmas, you know? That would be something like the 21st, I think, would be the Tuesday of Christmas week. And I thought, yeah, okay, we'll do episodes up until then, then we'll take a nice little break, you know, come back refreshed in the new year. But then, as I was thinking more about it, I thought, you know what? We've probably earned more of a break than that, haven't we? It's been a rough year, man. 2021. I had a bizarre instance on the weekend. The way time has collapsed upon itself during the COVID, you know? So I had this bizarre thing on the weekend where I was talking about the Taco Bell. (laughs) I can tell you now that I think my throwing up in the back of the van thing on the run back from Texas just before COVID shut the world down, I had a horrendous food poisoning. I've talked about this on the show before. Don't need to go into the gory. And they were gory. Details again. But I think it was a Taco Bell thing, okay? We had eaten, I think, Subway that day, and I think even Burger King in the morning. It was an unholy trifecta of American road food, man. But it was after the Taco Bell that things got nasty. And so, I don't know this officially, all right? I do not have this on official authority and probably never will. But I think it was the Taco Bell that tipped me. Although, you know, there's some conjecture, there is dispute. Because Ken the Zen and I shared, like, a taco set or whatever. I got nailed. He didn't. And I know it can come down to a single bite of a single taco, okay? But it feels as though if uh, I had eaten something bad from the TB and Ken the Zen, although we didn't share... We had the same food together. We didn't share bites of the same thing. So it's 100% possible that I just got one bad bite of something and he didn't. Or maybe it wasn't caused by the Taco Bell at all. And I don't want to get sued here. I'm just saying I ate the Taco Bell and that seemed to kick off what became 30 pretty heinous hours of my life, okay? Regardless. We were talking, Ken Zen and I, just yesterday about that whole experience because he felt as though it was time for another run to the border, man. And I thought, I don't know if I can do it, man. I still got memories lingering in my head of the Taco Bell thing and its possible connection to my food poisoning from last year. And then we had to stop and be like, whoa. That wasn't last year, man. That was almost two years ago. (laughs) And it's time collapsing on itself. There are moments, like, I don't know which year exists less. I don't know if 2020 doesn't exist, or if 2021 doesn't exist, or if you combine them together and you get what feels like one year. But it's been weird, man. And there have been moments, you know, in the past little while, where I've felt the heaviness lift, and then we've got the Omicron thing, and we got new variants, and things are beginning to shut down again, and then you feel the weight come back down on your shoulders. It's been a weird ride, okay? Somehow we made it to Europe and back just before things went heinous over there again. Things are getting heinous here, and it's a lot of weight, man. I've felt weird ways in which time has collapsed. It's been very, very strange. I thought to myself, 
Maybe we've just earned a little extra break, like we can unplug. Still dealing with this, how do I navigate social media? How do I exist in that world? And I thought, why don't we just take an extra break? So instead of doing an episode next week, it seems likely, (laughs) never say never, kids, just like Triumph saying, it seems likely that this will be the last episode of the year, okay? Unless something spectacular comes to me in the next week or so, or I get a certain inspiration and decide to do one more. But until that happens, we'll consider that a bonus if it does, okay? For now, we'll call this the last episode of the year. My, my, doesn't time fly. I spent some time yesterday and this morning. This is a Manic Monday, kids. Just going through some of the episodes, and my goodness, what a volume of volume that is. (laughs) And it illustrates an object lesson that I've repeated more than once on this program, man, which is things are accomplished with consistent effort over time. Now, if we include this particular episode, 2021 has brought us 34 episodes of the John Huff Podcast, okay? That's about 30 hours of content. And if at the start of a project, someone comes along to you and says, okay, man, I want you to produce 30 hours of content in 34 episodes. What do you do? You kind of freak out, man. Looking at such a big picture project goal (laughs) over time, you think, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about for 30 hours? How am I ever going to produce that? It's impossible. And you collapse on yourself just like time over the past two years, right? I'm dealing with that right now on a project. But the thing is, if you just chip away at it with consistent effort over time, all of a sudden you come to a year-ish later and you got 34 episodes and 30 hours of content. Whoa. If you don't look at it big picture as one whole thing, and just take it in bite-sized chunks, those tasty morsels. Hopefully you don't get food poisoning from them. You know, all of a sudden, at the end of a period of time, you've got what you can call a completed project. I got a year of podcasts, 34 episodes, and there were two substantial breaks in there. 34 episodes, around 30 hours of content, and you're like, wow! That added up, didn't it? And it works the same way with anything. You know, losing weight, building a physique, writing a book, writing an album, getting better at the drums, learning a language, whatever it is, the way to approach it is small, consistent effort over time. And it just adds up, man. You do an hour a day of practice on whatever. You accumulate 300, 350, 365 hours of practice, you will improve or you will create a body of work. I have created a body of work over the past year in sometimes difficult circumstances. It has been stressful. 2021, perhaps less stressful than 2020, although, you know, we're ratcheting that up again. Don't have your holiday gatherings, kids. 2021 was still difficult psychologically for me. You know, I've still struggled with a bit of anxiety, a bit of purposelessness, a bit of directionlessness. If not for the Euro tour that I was lucky enough to do with Sarah, I would have played, I don't know, five shows this year? Maybe not even that many. Maybe five. Now, I'm accustomed at this point in time to playing like a hundred shows a year. <laughs> It's what I do, you know, and that just has still gone away. If not for the Euro tour and the 30 or so gigs that was, we're talking about five. And in 2020, I think it was like two, maybe three. Stuff has still gone away. It's been a weird pressure. It's been difficult. It's been frustrating. There's still a lot of fear floating around. And now there's this accompanying anger floating around with the fear. It's a toxic cocktail, man. It is a sour soup. (laughs) In the air, you know what I mean? Still, you know, consistent effort over time. You bang out content 
You bang out your book, you bang out your record, you bang out improving your scales on guitar, whatever it is. Consistent effort over time. But I think we've earned a break, man. I think we have earned just a little bit longer break than I was planning. So it's theoretically possible that there will be an episode next week. But for now, we're saying officially this is the end of the year episode. And what do we do on the end of the year episode, kids? Well, there's a temptation to do a kind of year in review. I ain't going to do that. What I am going to do, however, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, is the John Huff Podcast Song of the Year for 2021. There was a point in time when I was using more sound effects on this show, and I would have used one right there. Not going to do that, okay? One of my goals for the year in terms of delivering the show was to streamline it, okay? And I tried, at a certain point, to shorten the intro, and the fan base went crazy. We love that intro, don't change it. So I brought back the original intro, all right? If you go through the 2020 episodes, I was having fun with the the pre-roll, the cold intros to the show. And I was doing a lot of voices, recreating scenes, you know, making sounds. It was a lot of fun to do. But it's time-consuming, man, and I needed to streamline the production of this program to make it a little bit lighter. (laughs) There was an existential heaviness to it. There was kind of an obligatory heaviness. I was making it harder to produce than it needed to be, okay? And once a thing gets hard to do, stops being fun to do, very, very difficult to do it. For me, at least. I'm not very good at being told to do something. I'm not very good at having to do something, you know? Kills a lot of things for me, and I need to reframe it. So one of the things I had to do with this show was just streamline the production. All right, we're not going to do the movie scene recreations anymore. Just going to do cold intro and go. I don't do the drum bumpers anymore. I don't even roll the outro anymore. (laughs) Had to streamline it, you know? Just for my own mental clarity and peace of mind. But a funny thing happened along the way, you know. We are going to get to the song of the year, don't worry. Because I was going back and listening, and it's very interesting still to watch how a thing evolves. Now, if you go back to the first five, six, seven, ten episodes of the show, I've talked about this before, we have a completely different program. By rights, I should rename the show, you know. And I'm still tempted to take down some of those episodes because I'm just embarrassed by them. Not by the content of the interviews, but by the content of me, you know? So you go all the way back, you have an utterly different program. And then there was a a point where I did the first solo episode, and you go back and listen to that, and that feels an utterly different program, too. The voice of delivery has evolved over time. So even if you go back to the beginning of 2021, it's a solo episode, but it feels different. The voice is close. The delivery is close, but it's still a little bit closed. You know what I mean? Close, but closed. Put a D on there, right? And it's just interesting to me to go back and just sample some of the episodes from earlier in 2021 and feel how much the show has changed. Now, there was... A pinnacle moment in the evolution, which happened, you know, people say to me all the time, what's your favorite episode of the year, man? What's your favorite one? Very difficult for me to answer that because I barely remember last week's episode. I talk about a lot of random things. We go kind of all over the place. It's very, very difficult for me to nail down what was a favorite out of all of that. But there is one that stands out for me this year, okay? And that's an episode that marked a kind of turning point, and it was number 84, which was the first official superficial history that I did on the show. It was about the Altamont Free Concert, where a dude got shot up as the Rolling Stones were playing. The first time I did a genuinely focused episode around an historical event, and it was all about that. That was, for me, a turning point, you know? That was probably my favorite episode of the year, and I liked the Comiskey Park one, 
and I liked the superficial histories. And I want to do more of them, but I find it very, very difficult to find topics that work. Maybe I'll spend a little bit of time over the break thinking about that, you know. But it's funny and interesting to watch how the program evolved even over the 34 episodes of this year. That's the other thing, man. If you're a podcaster or want to be one, or a songwriter or any sort of a writer, blogger, whatever, as you accumulate the material, as you put in the consistent effort over time, things evolve. Your voice, in some cases, literally emerges, man. But you can't get to the voice that's yours, the style that's yours, the best writing that's yours, the best music that's yours, whatever. You can't get to that without this process of evolving through the stages, right? And you evolve through the stages by putting in the consistent effort over time. That's another thing I had to be reminded of going back to just January of this year, hearing the difference between one of those episodes and this current one, which you may think is crap, I don't know, but the delivery has evolved, all right? And had I not gone through some of the pre-Altamont episodes where I talked about the Elvis thing or some of the big band stuff, I began to dabble into the histories a little bit. The Cars, the new wave, and then that blossomed into this whole new idea, which is the superficial histories. And that will happen for you as well as you begin to just produce, just practice. New ideas will come to you out of the ether, new ways of doing things, new approaches to things, and all of this does not happen if you're sitting in your chair doing theoretical brainstorming. You can't think your way to some of this stuff. You have to process your way to some of this stuff. So if we went back to me, as I was producing the first episode of the show, the Phoenix Fire episode, which was great, and he's a great dude and an amazing story, But if you had shown that person who produced that episode the 84th episode of the program, which was a superficial history delivered solo style, that person would have been very, very surprised by where his show went 84, 83 episodes later. But you can't get there without having gone through the process of finding the voice, finding the style and then having the idea to present it in such a way. So my advice to you, as we head into New Year's resolution time, is to begin a thing and let it evolve, okay? Don't look at, I gotta write an album. Start with the first song. Just let that evolve, you know, begin to produce things. If you want to be a content creator of any style, doesn't matter what it is, a visual artist, a poet, whatever. Begin at the beginning without a lot of pressure on it. Come at it with the ideas you currently have. Work on them. Stretch them. Stretch your own muscles. Develop your own muscles. Develop your own capacity. Develop your own style, man. And in the process of doing that, new ideas, new evolutions, new way of of doing things will present themselves to you, and then you can follow that, and those trails will lead you to the best of what you can be. I don't feel like I'm at the best of what this podcast can be, but it's all part of the evolution, and it's way better than it was, you know? So do that if you are committing yourself to anything. That can be a weight loss journey. That can be a weight gain journey. That can be a spiritual development journey. Begin at the beginning develop yourself, let it evolve, see what ideas come to you that you can roll with and expand on to become and to do things better, all right? Now let's talk about the song of the year before I forget to set that up, okay? We talked about so much freaking music this year. (laughs) If you go to the John Huff podcast referenced on the podcast playlist, you'll find 77 songs on there. Some of them added in 2020, all right, admittedly, but we talked about a ton of music and a ton of different styles of music. We had big band from the 40s. We had Foo Fighters. 
We had hair metal. We had Christian rock from the 80s. We had pop. We had all sorts of different stuff. And I find it supremely edifying to go to that particular playlist because for me, it's a record, right? It's a record of the records <laughs> that we talked about. And so you've got Maria McKee, Neil Young, Mammoth, Chuck Mangione, Alice Cooper, the Dead Daisies, Kings of Leon, Rush, and Brandy Carlisle, and Willie Nelson, and Liz Stringer, and Cherry Poppin' Daddies, my pals Grace Fire, The Hip, The Linda Lindas, Bikini Kill, Elvis, The War on Drugs, Samantha Fish, Grinder Blues. We talked about Megadeth, we talked about The Cars, we talked about Lily Hyatt, we talked about Ghost, Jerry Cantrell, Volbeat. We talked about so much different music, and I'm stoked about that, and I know that people discovered new music as I was discovering it through the show. Wonderful gift to you, and in amongst, wonderful gift to you, and wonderful gift to me, by the way. Very edifying. And as we went through that music, we encountered some great tunes, man. And I've got here a short list. I'm going to give you later in the show the countdown, the top five songs of the year, according to the John Huff podcast. But I'm going to give you six titles because we had a tie for one spot. I just couldn't break it, okay? Top five songs of the year, according to me on this podcast. Here we go. In no particular order, okay? They are Anthem for America by Crazy Licks. They are The End of the Game by Weezer. I Don't Live Here Anymore by The War on Drugs. Hunter's Moon by Ghost. Bustle and Flow by The Dead Daisies. And Dangerous by Liz Stringer, okay? Those are my nominees for the top five. Remember, there is a tie. And we're going to talk about them just towards the end of the show. I want you to noodle those over. Think about what you think was my number one song of the freaking year, okay? Before we get to that, I am going to, because I don't want to just be a tease, you know? So I'm going to give you the answer to something. Because as we talk about new music, we also talk about a lot of older music, okay? And I'm introducing what I'm calling the Retro Song of the Year competition, all right? Retro Song of the Year is... The best song that I either discovered or rediscovered this year, okay? Last year, in a landslide, that would have been Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes by Edison Lidos, but we didn't do this competition last year. And I know you're freaked out right now because we talked at length about that, which is my favorite song of all time, and that was not this year. It was 2020. That freaked me out, man, because time is all weird. <laughs> I can't even, I don't even know what's when anymore. But last year, it, we'll give that, you know, posthum nah, posthumously is not the right word. We'll give it retroactively. Last year, love grows where my rosemary goes, okay? This year, we got three nominees stepping up to the plate. The nominees for Retro Song of the Year on the John Huff Podcast are Anytime featuring Robin McCauley with MSG. They are Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do by Elvis from the 1968 comeback special. And they are Magic by Olivia Newton-John. And I would do the drum roll sound effect here, but I'm not doing sound effects anymore, okay? Except for the closing door at the end of each episode. But I can tell you now that the retro song of the year for 2021 is Magic by Olivia Newton-John. Wow. I had totally forgotten about Magic by Olivia Newton-John, which was one of my formative tunes, man, when I was a little, little boy. This song was like 1980, so I was probably like seven years old when this came out. I remember hearing this on the radio a lot. It was a big song, man. And there is something so creepy and weird <laughs> about the musical arrangements and about the verses on that song. And then that chorus that just grabs you and will not let go. And I was too young to be in love with Olivia Newton-John. I hadn't even seen any photos of her, man. It was 1980. I didn't see any photos of Olivia. I certainly didn't see the movie. 
which won a raspberry, which inspired the raspberries <laughs> that that song was in. I didn't see the movie. I didn't see any pictures. I didn't see any video. I just heard the song on the radio, man. Many times, and it got into my head, and Magic by Olivia Newton-John was one of my favorite songs ever, and I rediscovered it this year, and it wins the John Huff Podcast Retro Song of the Year Award, so congratulations, Olivia. Insert crowd applause sound effect here. And that Elvis tune, I also had a mess of blues because a mess of blues was maybe my first song ever. <laughs> a mess of blues by Elvis Presley plays an important role in the evolution of this podcast, actually. Because I was watching a documentary about Elvis on the Netflix, and just a snippet of that song was played, A Mess of Blues, which is one of Elvis's early, legit, real Elvis blues tunes. And I had forgotten about it totally. And I heard it, and I'm like, I forgot about that song, man. But I was a little, little tiny boy leaning up against the speaker of my parents' record player which was massive, a piece of furniture, listening to A Mess of Blues. That might have been my very first song that I can remember, A Mess of Blues by Elvis. Went back and listened to that, and that led me on what was a precursor to a legit superficial history, which was talking about the 1968 Elvis comeback special, which is another favorite episode of mine for this year. It was not an official superficial history, but it was a precursor to that. And rediscovering a mess of blues led me into looking more into Elvis, which led me to the 1968 comeback special, which led me to Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do? Which is such a great freaking tune, man. Put some distortion on that guitar, drop some drums in, get Tom Kiefer to sing it. You got a Cinderella song, man. Just this heavy, really great blues track. Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do? And it was almost my retro song of the year, along with A Mess of Blues, and it rekindled my interest in and my appreciation for the king, man. Love that freaking song. And then Anytime by MSG was one of my favorite tunes from the hair era, <laughs> the glam era, when Robin McCauley was singing with MSG, and they put out a couple of really great records. Anytime was a ballad. A kind of a hard rock ballad. Really, really great song. And it came into our sphere because I was on the YouTube and I saw a video of Robin McCauley singing that tune. Kind of an MSG, you know, flying circus. They had all the people from MSG and there have been a lot of them kind of touring together. And they bring out the different singers to do some tunes and they brought out Robin McCauley. And this is just a few years ago. Now, this dude is seriously pushing 70 at this point. That's a scary prospect for any of those glam singers from back in the day because so many of them cannot sing anymore, at least not like they used to. And then out comes Robin McCauley, and I'm like, oh, man, Robin, don't blow this dude. And he sounded like 1990. It was freaking stunning, man. And he sang Anytime, and then I started playing Anytime on the drum. I'd forgotten that tune as well, man. That's part of the criteria, I think, for a retro song of the year. It's like one that I haven't thought of for 30 years. And then I'm like, that's a great song. How did I forget that? And the Rob McCauley singing anytime was like, wow, mind blown. He was fabulous. And then I went back and started listening to that song again. Absolutely terrific. And of course, Rob McCauley is the singer in Black Swan, who probably last year would have won album of the year if we had done that. The Black Swan record is great. There's a new one coming. Robin McCauley sounds incredible still at 70. Just like Glenn Hughes from the Dead Daisies, man. It's possible to do. It's possible to hold your voice together. Think you got to take care of it. All right, get off the whiskey. Get off the pot. Protect that voice, man. Keep exercising it. Learn some technique. You can hold on to it. And that tune anytime is great. Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do by Elvis is so freaking cool. Go watch his performance of that on the 1968 comeback special. It's freaking great. But the retro song of the year for me, Magic by Olivia Newton-John. That creepy, wonderful, catchy 1980 mega hit, which was a formative tune for me as a kid, man. So congratulations to you, Olivia. 
So before we get to the song of the year, kids, I know you're all waiting with bated breath to see what it is. I actually played a show on the weekend. I said on the last episode that I was getting ready to play a gig with Fresh Breath. I've talked to various people over the, you know, the last year, and they're like, we like your road stories, man. I thought when I went to Europe this year that I would have lots of new road stories to tell you, but it didn't turn out to really be the case. It was a pretty normal tour in that sense. Like, there wasn't a lot of novel things for me to talk about. And it goes by in a blur, and I did not blog it, and I did not hold on to a lot of chestnuts. I just wanted to make some memories and keep them, you know? Didn't have a lot of road stories, but I played a gig. Yeah, apart from the Europe tour, there were no road stories. (laughs) There was no road, man. There are bands touring now, but for most of the year, there weren't really, and that includes me. Played a gig with The Fresh Breath last weekend, and I've played some strange venues in my day, man. (laughs) This time it was a bowling alley. Whoa, a bowling alley in L-Town. Social Bowl, which, uh, God love them, man, they are playing live music every weekend, and what they've done is they've set up a stage over top of, like, three bowling lanes. Very strange, man, but it's actually really, really cool. I'm not bagging on the Social Bowl, it's actually a really cool setup. Bit strange to have bowling pins exploding underneath me throughout the whole show. I thought that would be a problem. Like, that's going to mess up my time, man. (laughs) But with help from an enormous stage monitor to my left, and just being in the music, I didn't really notice the bowling pins. But then you can watch people bowling at you, and you think to yourself, are they strong enough to get their fingers caught in the ball and lose their trajectory and have that ball just come wailing right up on stage? But you'd have to be, I don't know who. One of the strongest people in the world, probably, to throw a bowling ball and hit one of us. Especially me at the back. Sometimes it pays to be the drummer kids, you're at the back, you know what I mean? You're not in any of the photographs, because the singer's always in front of you. But at least you don't get hit by bowling balls. Unless the world's strongest man is throwing them. So, we set up to play the social bowl in L-Town. Which is actually really kind of cool, man. And it was fun to freaking play! I've not done a lot of playing. I've been lucky enough to do more playing than most people this year. But by my standards, not a lot of playing. So Fresh Breath, again, is the husband and wife duo, Katie and Josh. And they normally travel around just as a duo together. But once in a while, they bring in the dream team. That's Ken the Zen on bass and myself on the drums. We played two EP release shows with them in the summertime. Go listen to the Fresh Breath EP, How Did I Get Here? Really, really terrific stuff kind of roots, kind of Americana, kind of country, kind of folk, a little bit rock and roll. You know, when we play live, we cover the Doobies and we cover the Almond Brothers and Tom Petty and the hip, you know what I mean? Kind of in that vein, right? And so we hadn't played with them since summertime and then they booked this gig in L-Town. Come on and play the bowling alley with us. And that was a fun night, man. It was fun to get out and play. And I was about to say, you know, Have optimism and have faith, kids, that the live music is coming back. And it is up to a point, but this new variant thing is bugging me. Because I just, I don't exactly feel us teetering on the edge of a lockdown. But I don't exactly not feel us teetering on the edge of another lockdown. And that makes me a little bit worried about the prospects for live music again. Because it seems like that's the first thing to go, man. You can keep playing your NFL football games. It's okay to have 60,000 people in a crowd together, but you can't put 20 in a bar (laughs) so that the band can play, you know what I mean? So I'm hoping that it's coming back. It was very nice to play. And it's wonderful to play with people like Katie and Josh who are great at what they do, who are pros at what they do, but are also super humble, super easy to get along with. You know, the way you fit into a situation like that as a side player is you learn the stuff, man, and I've been pouring hours and hours and hours into learning their set, into learning their covers, into fitting as seamlessly as I can into what they do, learning some harmony parts to sing along, you know what I mean? Preparation is part of professionalism, okay? 
And, you know, they came up from, they live a couple hours away. They come up for rehearsals. You know, good on them. You got to put that effort in, man, because you want your show to be as good as it can be. I'm not into half-ass shows. I'm not into half-ass gigs, man. Sometimes time makes it that way. But I want to be as polished and pro as we can be on stage. And those guys make the effort to do that. And I applaud it, all right? And they welcome the side players into the gig. They are grateful to have the side players in on the gig with them. And you feel that. And you feel that humility. And we all get along great. And we play well together. And it was just fun to do that. And then you find yourself in a bowling alley. One time, Ken the Zen and I, our trio, the three, we got hired to play like a campground. Okay, do that on a Saturday night. And then we showed up. And they're like, oh, we double booked. It's also bingo night. (laughs) So what we're going to get you to do is between rounds of bingo, you guys will go up and play a few songs. So we played bingo night. And I played some weird clubs around the world, man, where strange stuff is going on. And now I've played a bowling alley. And it was actually really fun, for starters. Super fun to play with those guys. Great music, had a really good time. And kind of a cool, novel sort of an atmosphere to look around at. A lot of people watching. A lot of bad bowling going on out there, kids. But I'm not a great bowler myself, so I can't really point the finger. And they have, like, some cool arcade games. There's another place in town, in L-Town, called Tilt, which is a retro arcade, man. I went there a few weeks ago for somebody's birthday. And it's like a dream. I had this idea many years ago to open a retro arcade. It's like, let's do that. Because as a kid, I grew up at peak arcade era, man. I was like a middle to older teenager as arcades were happening. Spent many, many, many happy hours and many, many, many not so happy quarters at the arcade, man, playing Double Dragon and playing like Tecmo Wrestling, whatever that was, TWA Wrestling and Arch Rivals Basketball, and Odd Galaga, you know the games. You're all my age, you know what I'm talking about. And there's a nostalgia, and a kind of weird joy in that. I'm like, we should open up a retro arcade, where it's a quarter, man. Because if you, you know, in most places, if you run across those games now, it's like a buck, or a two dollar token. To play 30 seconds of Galaga, I don't think so, man. That should be a quarter. So I had this idea. We should do that. And, of course, I never did anything with that, because I don't know how to make that happen. And how do you make money on a quarter? Very, very tough to do, all right? They open up the retro arcade downtown. It is packed out with almost every game you can think of from back in the day. There's, I don't know, 100 of them? Something like that? And at the booths, they got big TVs with Nintendo set up, and you can play some old Nintendo games. And there's just a bank, two banks of pinball machines. I hate pinball. (laughs) I don't get pinball. How do you get good at pinball? Like, I literally can lose three balls in about 15 seconds. I don't get it. It makes me angry, so I don't play a lot of pinball. But here's how they make the money, all right? They got all these machines, everything you can think of from back in the day. It's freaking glorious. Except wrestling and except arch rivals basketball. And I would like to see those added, okay? You pay five bucks at the door. All right, five bucks all you can play. You don't got to put anything in the dang machine. You just hit the button for a new player. Whoa! So we got to, like, run the entire Double Dragon video game beginning to end. Whoa! And I got killed like a hundred times, which didn't used to happen back in the day, man. We had that game down to a freaking science. The science is lost. I still remembered a couple of things, but died over and over and over. And that would have cost me all of my money for the week. (laughs) You pay a $5 cover and it's all wide open. You die a hundred times, but you finish the game. Very, very cool. But then they got beer and they got food. And the cover is what it is, but they make the money on the food, right? The place was packed out with a lot of young kids, too, by the way. Wasn't all just 40 and 50 somethings reliving their lost youth. There was a lot of kids there checking this out. Very, very freaking cool. I don't know how I got onto the retro arcade. <laughs> I don't know what I was talking about. But it was fun to do. Oh, I know. 
we were talking about playing the social bowl with fresh breath they had a lot of kind of older games happening too it was fun and it was fun to go to that arcade and play so if you're in l town or surrounding environs come in town and go to the tilt play the old video games have a ball man it was fun to play with fresh breath you should check out their music play a bowling alley and this is what happens man this is what happens inside player land this is what happens in music land Sometimes you're playing above a bowling lane. Sometimes you're playing the main stage in a thousand seater. It's a wild ride, man, but it was fun to do. And I don't know what the prospects are for music. At this moment, I am potentially, it looks like, embarking on a new project that I will talk about when that's a little more firm. I'm excited about it. It's going to be kind of cool, but we'll see. You know, so that's my last show of the year. And it was a good one. And I'm hoping that 2022 opens up to where I can go back to playing properly a lot, you know, and maybe some festivals and building something, getting back into the game, you know what I mean? But it was fun to do and fun to play. And I hope all of you musicians out there get your chance to get out and play too, man, because I know it's been tough. 2021 has been tough. 2020 was brutal, man, especially for those of us who are trying to kind of make a living playing the music. And they just took it away, man. And very, very tough. And I know that's a grind, and I know it's wearing a lot of us down. So I want you to take this holiday season and do things you enjoy, all right? If you've had it all taken away from you, if you're struggling with the weight of variance and all this stuff, I want you to take as much time as you can over the holiday season to unplug and step away, man. And just relax. Listen to music you enjoy. Watch programs that you enjoy. You know? Be with people you enjoy. Step away from the rat race as much as you can. It's one of the reasons that I'm probably not doing another episode this year. I need to step away. It's not even about recharging. It's about refocusing. It's about focusing at all, actually. You know, a lot of the time, and you can, the evidence is this episode. I'm just scrambling along here. <laughs> I need to pull away and stop thinking and just let my brain relax, get off the freaking social media. The more I read about the social media, the more I'm learning about what it's doing to people's brains. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, man. I just know what's happening in my own brain and my own ability to focus on things, attention span, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, this phone addiction. I need to break that cycle. And one of the things is, not doing the podcast for a few weeks because my primary reason for being on social media is to advertise the podcast. So unplug if you can, all right, over the holiday season. Have real interactions with real people. (laughs) Do that, all right? Enjoy yourselves, relax, let your brain settle a little bit. Do mindless things, do mindful things, but try and step away from the stresses and anything that makes you go really fast. (laughs) Scrolling social media makes your brain go fast. It's fatiguing, man. Your brain is taking in all of this stimulation. It's very fatiguing. So step back from it if you can. I'm going to do things that make you happy. And then hopefully in 2022, things will begin to open up again for real and we can get back to living the lives we enjoy so much. Or maybe living better ones, you know what I mean? I don't want to go off on another rant here, so let's get to the real most important element of this bizarre end-of-year podcast episode, all right? Let's get to the John Huff Podcast 2021 Song of the Year. I will give you the nominees again in no particular order. They are The End of the Game by Weezer, Anthem for America by Crazy Licks, I Don't Live Here Anymore by The War on Drugs, Dangerous by Liz Stringer, Bustle and Flow by the Dead Daisies, and Hunter's Moon by Ghost. The criteria here is tunes that I most listened to, basically, throughout the year, okay? There's been a zillion great songs. I'm going to give you some honorable mentions before we get down to brass tacks. But the idea here is these are the songs that I kind of kept coming back to and kept listening to over and over and over. These are the ones that stood out, not mathematically, not 
by my brain, but by my repeated listens. These are the ones that pulled me back in, okay? Now, before we get to the real deal countdown, honorable mentions, Twisted Ambition by Samantha Fish, another artist I discovered this year via the great Sarah Tomek. Great blues guitar player, great singer. Samantha Fish released an album called Faster this year. It's really, really terrific. Go listen if you haven't. There's a great, just little one and a half bar guitar solo in that tune that makes it for me. Samantha Fish, she's so cool. Go listen to her. Quit Waking Me Up by Cheap Trick. Remember when we talked about the new Cheap Trick record that sounds like a Cheap Trick record and that's what's great about it? Quit Waking Me Up is such a fun song. It's such a Cheap Trick song. Loved it and it almost made my top five, okay? 1989 by Nestor. Another kind of retro song. There's like a vibe happening here. 1989, tuned from Nestor's most recent record that came out recently. Really, really fun. Kind of a Bon Jovi, I don't know, autograph kind of sounding tune. Really, really liked it. My favorite song on their record by a long, long shot. And almost made the top five. I listened to it a lot this year. And then I'm going to go Middle Earth by Whitehorse, okay? I got a shout out from Whitehorse when I talked about them on whatever episode that was earlier this year. Appreciate that, Whitehorse. Acknowledge your fans who acknowledge you, kids, okay? Don't forget to do that. Middle Earth from Whitehorse's new record is really, really terrific. Go listen to it again. It's this ethereal, dark folk kind of stuff. And Middle Earth is my favorite song on the album. Just dark, so dark, vibey, some great guitar tones happening some cool parts, just a really creepy, mystical song. Belongs in a Tarantino film, man. It's what they quoted from me when they acknowledged me via the Twitter. Song belongs in a Tarantino film, and it does, and it's an honorable mention this year for Song of the Year. Okay, now let's get down to it. You could stop wasting my time with your endless jibber-jabber and just get to the point. We could do this. Number five. John Huff Podcast 2021 Song of the Year. This is where we have a tie, kids, and the tie is between Bustle and Flow by the Dead Daisies and Hunter's Moon by Ghost. Hard for me not to give that to Ghost, all right? Because you know Ghost is one of my favorite bands ever, and I love Hunter's Moon. Came out late in the year. I listened to it many, 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 many times in the back of the van over in Europe. Just a great Ghost song. Ghost goes in weird directions. You know, there are keys that they choose that are strange chord progressions that are strange they manage to be heavy and pop at the same time hunter's moon is a great freaking song i loved it and i tied it all right instead of bouncing the dead daisies out i'm like we're gonna keep them both because bustle and flow by the dead daisies is a great song and the dead daisies record holy ground is one of my favorite records of the year it's freaking heavy it's catchy and you got glenn hughes the man the myth the legend singing on this tune, who also at 70, like Robin McCauley, sounds freaking amazing, man, it is possible to do. And I love the call and answer kind of verses on that song. It's heavy, great guitar tones. I love that tune, Bustle and Flow by the Dead Daisies, and it ties with Ghost for number five of 2021, the number four song of the year on the John Huff Podcast. End of the Game by Weezer. All right, this came from the Van Weezer record, which was Weezer presenting a bunch of original songs kind of inspired by the 80s hard rock sound, all right? End of the Game. It's all Weezer. It still sounds like Weezer. It's got those big, chunking, chuggy, sludgy, heavy Weezer kind of guitar tones. A little bit higher fidelity, maybe. Harkening back to that 80s kind of sound. I loved The End of the Game. It was my favorite song on that record. And that was earlier this year, man. It's been out for quite a while now. And I continue to go back and listen to The End of the Game by Weezer. Love the guitar tones. Love the whole vibe of that tune. It's a great song. And it's number four, all right? The number three song of the year on the John Huff Podcast is... Anthem for America by Crazy Licks. All right, Crazy Licks, man. Anthem for America. It's the number three song of the year for me, all right? That's a bronze medal, kids. You know, that goes in the trophy case. Crazy Licks is a 
I was about to call them like a modern glam metal band, which is technically what they are, but they've been out for a long dang time, all right? They are not a novelty. They've put out a lot of records. Their new record came out this year. It's called Street Lethal. It's a terrific, slamming, hard rock, glam metal, rock and roll album. Anthem for America is such a good song. Man, they're from Sweden. And they're singing about America, man. Just great guitar riff, you know, great vocals on it. Great chorus on it. Great everything. It's just a great glam rock tune, man. And it's put your fist in the air. That was what the glam was all about, man. Glam was a massive F you to authority. Glam was, we are going to party while we're young, man. <laughs> we'll sleep when we're dead. That's what glam was. It was fists in the air. It was good times. It was a freaking party. And this tune, Anthem for America, is all about that, man. The grunge came along and it was so morose and sad. Grunge people killed themselves. You know what I mean? The, the people who died from the hair metal rec era died from overdoses, man. They were having a good time. You know what I mean? Anthem for America is great. And it inspired an episode. It inspired the When Did Glam Metal Die episode. So thank you, Crazy Licks, for that. Street Lethal is a very cool record. Go listen to it, okay? What do we do now? We got two and we got one. At the Mr. Olympia contest, they bring the final two up together and then they announce the winner. Because they would announce second place and then everybody would jump on the guy who won. <laughs> and second place would be kind of lost. I don't know, it's weird. How do we do this? Except to say... The song that came second, I thought all year was going to come first. And then later in the year, the song that came first was released. Number two on the John Huff podcast, song of the year poll is Dangerous by Liz Stringer. Could have been number one. If I did this again tomorrow, maybe it would be. But Dangerous by Liz, Liz Stringer, she is an Australian singer-songwriter. She released her new record this year, which is called First Time Really Feeling. It's terrific. Liz is terrific. And this song, Dangerous, got kind of a Bruce Coburn vibe. It's like a driving. And it's not folk rock. It's a rock tune. It's a rock tune, but not really a modern rock tune. I don't know how else to describe it. Great chorus, great lyrics, great pocket. It's just a really, really cool song. And I thought all year long, I thought all year long, Liz Stringer's Dangerous was going to be the song of the year because uh, I've been listening to it for months and months and months over and over and over. It's a wonderful freaking tune. Great record. And I really dig on Liz Stringer and I love that song. It's great. It's number two. And it would easily have been number one had the war on drugs not released. I don't live here anymore in the fall. And it is not. It is not a I love the war on drugs so they win kind of vote. I had to come down to how often did I listen to this song and what did it do to me? And when I Don't Live Here Anymore came out, I listened to it. I told you this. I was in Europe. I had it on repeat for hours in my headphones. That song still gets me, man. It is rare. Liz Stringer's Dangerous is so good that it needed an all-time song to beat it. You know what I mean? <laughs> For me, I Don't Live Here Anymore by The War on Drugs is an all-time song. When I, you know, at the end of my days, compile my 20 best of all time song list <laughs> on whatever Spotify at that point, you'll just have to think of it and it will automatically happen and be broadcast to the world. You don't have to type anything. No mouse clicks, nothing. You just think it'll happen. That's where the technology is going, man. Complete cyborg integration. I Don't Live Here Anymore by The War on Drugs is my favorite song of the year. It is number one. And I didn't do an album of the year thing, but the album I Don't Live Here Anymore would have won, okay? It's a, an incredible album. Going to be Grammy nominated, I'm sure. The title track, I Don't Live Here Anymore, just affected me in ways. There is something about that keyboard part that runs over top of everything, which did not exist in the original demo, okay? Adam Grandesil wrote this thing. It was probably like on acoustic guitar, sent it off to the keyboard player who was wondering if he was working on anything. Said, here, I got this. What do you think? And then the keyboard player sends it back. And he says, I don't know. I put this kind of thing on it. Probably doesn't work. Let me know what you think. 
And what it did was utterly transform the song and lift it into what it became. So the number one song of the year for me is I Don't Live Here Anymore by The War on Drugs. That is not an I Love The War on Drugs vote. That is the song I listened to most this year and continue to listen to even now, kids. When I started, I thought we'd get about 15 minutes in and then I'd be stuck for something to say. But I managed to get to an hour-ish full-length episode, kids, and it's probably going to be the last one for this year unless a miracle happens. So if you don't see anything next week, you'll know that this is the last one of the year and we'll be back eventually. I want you to enjoy your holidays. I want you to listen to good music, eat good food, drink good drinks, hang out with good people, okay? As much as you can, I want you to unplug from the world. I want you to let your brains rest. I want you to let ideas come in. And I want you to think about what you want to accomplish, okay? Do not be daunted by sheer volume. All right? Take it all, everything you want to do. Take it one little chunk at a time and do that chunk consistently until you step back in a year and you've got 34 episodes, 30 hours of content, okay? That's how this goes. Speaking of going, I'm going to go. I'm going to shut up shutting up. I won't be on Instagram much over the next little while, but JW underscore off on the Instagram. Find the John Huff Podcast Facebook page if you want to follow along. I'm going to ask you as a special holiday present to me. <laughs> you know, I don't ask you for much, kids. I'm going to ask you for a rating and review on your preferred podcast platform. I'm trying real hard to stay close to the radar, man. And it is your help sharing the episodes, whatever, telling people about it, ratings and reviews. These little things all accumulate in the same way, man. They help me out. I would appreciate it. Now, I really am going to shut up shutting up. Thank you again for your support this year. Thanks for hanging in. Thanks for feeding back. Thanks for writing in. Thanks for listening to the episodes. Thanks for indulging my various hiatuses while I needed to recharge or be on the road. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday season. Have a wonderful new year. Let me know what your resolutions are, man. I'm curious about them. Going to come up with a few of my own. For now, take care to all a warm cockle, and I'll check you later. Yeah. Now we went to see Bob Dylan dance to Desolation Row. And I don't live here anymore, but I got no place to go. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit much. <laughs>